Wayne will be joined virtually by Ni Adelaide, Head of Real Estate Finance Africa Regions at Standard Bank, Funke Okubadejo, Real Estate Director at Actus, Sheikh Sanankua, Managing Partner at HC Capital Properties, Thomas Riley, CEO at Lunga Real Estate, and Shavira Biseso, COO at Greya. Together, they will discuss the state of the market, unpacking further macroeconomics, global trends, and renewed focus for Africa's real estate. I'll leave it over to you, Wayne. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning. It's uh, fantastic to be here at another API Summit. As you heard, my name is Wayne Godwin, and I lead Jones Lang LaSalle's business in East Africa and the Indian Ocean, as well as JLL's Hotels and Hospitality Group. Now, the first panel today is a very exciting one. We're going to take a deep dive into investment on the continent, and as the headline would suggest, very much going to take a, a look at what's happening globally and how that is shaping what we see on the continent. I'll introduce my panelists shortly. Uh, but I think profiling them as a group uh, really does help set the scene for where the focus of the discussion is going to be. We're fortunate to be joined by some of the preeminent players uh, when it comes to offering and supporting institutional grade investment platforms on the continent. So with that in mind, today's discussion is, is going to be quite narrow in focus with a broad but simple question around how do we attract more of this capital to the region? I guess, why is this an important question? Well, well I think th this is the profile of liquidity that is a game changer. It, it allows us to push past that reliance on developments and allows us to bring more depth to our, our capital markets. Of course, we live in a highly connected uh, global real estate capital markets system. Last year, we saw $1.3 trillion worth of real estate transacted. Now, I'm about to intro some of the leading investment platforms and private equity players in the region whose combined real estate NAV is significant, but cumulatively would still represent approximately half of investment volumes that we see globally on a single day. So we very, are, very much are at a stage of infancy. Yeah. Uh, but these and other formative players have been absolutely important in terms of laying the groundwork, providing a blueprint, uh, and roadmap for the others that will follow. Hopefully many of you in the room today. Well, why, why is this? I mean, I think part of this, and we're going to get into a lot more detail, is that a lot of the world's largest private equity and sovereign wealth funds you know, simply won't get out of bed for anything less than $100 million. Now, in many cases, they don't even want their $100 million to be a majority share. So what is incredibly encouraging is that we now have a number of platforms that have demonstrated that you actually can deploy in excess of half a billion dollars into real estate in Africa, and often with quite a niche and specific focus. So I think, I mean, one of the major challenges for emerging market liquidity is having a lot of fanfare around these funds and around the raising of the, the capital, but then failure to meet deployment objectives. And I think what we're seeing now is a lot more success cases than, than, than failures in this regard. So this is, this is incredibly important. I, mean, I, I think a, just a quick synopsis of how capital is behaving globally from our perspective. Um, markets are holding up well. Uh, the head, but the headwinds that have, uh, are starting to impact sentiments and activity. I think the effects of the pandemic are now well behind us, uh, but you're going to be hearing a lot about the headwinds that have emerged and strengthened during Q2. I think inflation being chief amongst these. Um, th this, you know, this has, of course, triggered a tightening of monetary policy, it started with the Fed's announcement in November last year to begin tapering, and has continued with the hawkish policy we've seen from the Fed and ECB uh, through 2022. Now, I think a recession in 2023 is now broadly the dominant thesis. 
However, with unemployment sitting at only 3.6% in the US, 6.6% in Europe, analysts and central banks are certainly, I guess, questioning the definition of recession, right? And, and we found ourselves in quite a unique situation. You know, so, so as the global economy limps into 2023, the tailwinds supporting commercial real estate investments are still intact. Strong leasing, operational performance of logistics, living, and alternative sectors are really driving this. Um, while a strong labor market and consensus that the office remains the center of the workplace really underpins occupier demand. Another important tailwind driving real estate investment globally is that dry powder is sitting at near record levels. $384 billion accumulated by the end of Q2. Now, much of this capital has been sitting dry for some time, and there is pressure to deploy it. Um, and then I guess the next you know, part of that is that what we've been saying for a number of years around the hunt for yield has not changed. You know, there's still a lot of focus on growth sectors such as logistics and alternatives and living uh, that can provide that, that, that yield. But of course, with the de pressure to deploy, a lot of that has gone into, um, into portfolios. So what does this mean for Africa? We have yield, we have very high growth prospects, and we have a very significant demographic dividend, as you heard from Gulam. But very little of this capital has come into Africa as it's, uh, it's today. However, the bits that have provide a hugely important investment thesis for those that are going to follow. And, and we should start to see the compounding nature and snowball effect of this this capital, and I think it's, it's formative players like we have here today that, that have really so, sort of pushed past that frontier, and it's uh, great, great to be joined uh, by yourselves. So, gonna kick, kick things off. Ni, joining us online. Um, I think Gulam gave us some good context into the, the macroeconomics. I'd, I'd be, it'd be good to hear from yourself how you're seeing the, the, the macros and the impact on real estate investors. I think we've, we've obviously seen uh, the, the, the growth side impact, and, 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 but, but also a lot of um, public debt and sovereign debt that, that has come into the system. I mean, how are you looking at it in terms of a, a real estate investment uh, perspective? Thanks, thanks, um, thanks all. Thanks uh, for for the opportunity to join sixteen thousand miles away, um, or kilometers rather. Um, I, I think that's this is one of the unique opportunities that um, the pandemic sort of um, um, allowed. I mean, for two years ago, it would have been difficult to to make this connection. Um, I think from our perspective, from a standard bank point of view, um, I think Marlene mentioned it. Um, I mean, Gulam alluded to it. It remains a very um, attractive proposition. Um, uh, and we, despite some of the headwinds that um, came through on the pandemic side, you've seen very strong recoveries. Um, but more importantly, you've seen um, deepening activities and potentially sort of um, switching activities um, in into different sectors, or should I say evo evolution of different sectors or subsectors within the real estate markets, uh, and capital flows targeting those opportunities. Um, so you'd, 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 you'd have, um, apart from the traditional sectors of offices and retail, um, which, which attracted most of the capital activities uh, prior. Um, you're seeing sort of um, new capital activities deployed to um, sort of pure plays like um, cold storage, like industrial, um, student housing, um, residential, uh, affordable residential platforms, um, digital real estate, and themes that continue to support um, the opportunities and the growth um, prospects within the continent. I think similarly, um, it is, you know, the attraction of capital hasn't really, hasn't abated. There's, there, was, there's, there was some slowdown. Um, there was some shift in terms of the platforms that were used to deploy capital. 
Um, but I, I think um, um, Funke and, and Tom will speak more to that. Uh, but you've also seen that sort of uh, growth in participation of domestic capital sources that were either to sort of restricted. And for us, what that shows is, is more re greater resilience in, in the sector. It, it continues to strengthen the fundamentals of how you finance and support sort of real estate activities. Uh, and I think in our sector where the, the debt capital, which is sort of where we play from a Standard Bank point of view, um, is quite critical to the capital stack. It, it, it is fundamentally essentially a part of that, of that capital stack. The ability to continue to, dem to demonstrably sort of support and fund activities is extremely important for us and for sort of other financial institutions that participate in, 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 the, in that market. Make, strengthening and making the case for continuous sort of, um, of, of financing activity or should I say um, investment activity in real estate. Um, let me stop there for now. Um, yeah. I think that's I think that's an incredible point, uh, important point that you you make around you know the, the the size and the strength of also our local capital markets and our, and our local institutional sort of capital markets. I mean, I mean that that's got to be sort of that base layer. I mean, Cheik, how do you, how do you see the local uh, institutional capital um, currently in terms of the are we seeing enough of that coming into to real estate, or um, you know, is there is there still a lot more opportunity for it? Um, I think there is a, a lot more opportunity, and, and I think Funke will have the opportunity to speak about what it's done in, in Nigeria. Uh, but you know, we've actually accessed um, local capital markets, um, raising debt via private placement uh, green bond, um, but we've also done some club deals with local retail investors and I think that's the other side of the equation how do you create products that allow retail investors to participate um, and you know traditionally that would happen via um, you know the stock exchange uh, but you know there's also a number of things that you can do um, via private placements etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know it means that you have to be somewhat innovative um, and you know you have to do it gradually uh, to allow these investors to, to come in. And what we're saying is that you know, a lot of these investors actually want to put money into real estate, but historically they haven't had structured products um, that give them an easy path for investing in. So it's you know, for investors and developers to create these products for these institutional investors to participate in. And you know, the other thing that we're seeing uh, to tap into that, but also tap into international market is actually accessing the, the blockchain. I don't know if you, know, you guys have followed, but uh, KKR recently, um, as part of their fundraise for the Global Healthcare Fund, um, basically put part of their fund, tokenized part of their fund on the blockchain, um, basically allowing retail investors to participate. And that's also something that uh, we're investigating, which allows obviously local investors, but also international investors, so somebody that could be you know, in mm. Asia, in Latin America, mm. in the US, um, to access some of the, the products. And you know, there's a lot of, there was a lot of questions for a long time around KYC, et cetera, but now this whole space is being institutionalized uh, in a way that you, know, you yeah. have third-party mm. providers that allow yeah. you to, to pass the, the KYC and, mm. and have third-party uh, uh, stewardship. Yeah. Um, to make sure that funding um, can come in via these platforms. So I think with these three buckets, um, you know, one should be mm. able to uh, tap further into the, the mm. local funding, but also broaden the scope of international funding that can flow into the space. Sure, sure. and I think just with Gulam's graph around that sort of growth, quarter of the world's population living on the continent, that's a lot of retail investors, right? Um, Thomas, I mean, you spend a lot of your time abroad talking to uh, global investors about Africa. Um, I mean, how are global investors looking at the opportunity uh, for, for investing into Africa? It's, um, it's, it's quite an interesting one. I mean, you know, there's, there's no doubt that, you know, if you're speaking to a large international, in, you know, investor, be that a pension fund or an asset management business or the like, uh, in New York or London or Frankfurt, Africa is still quite niche. You know? So you know, the, 
it's not a run-of-the-mill, everyday sort of investment proposition that they would consider. And the, the reality is that it's been hampered, you know, over the last decade or, or, or two in terms of, you know, real credible platforms and, and propositions that tick the box in terms of um, the, the suitable level of sophistication, suitable level of governance, um, et cetera, that, that will allow them to actually, you know, yeah. start to put... Uh, put some capital in. So I, I think that that's starting to change though. You know, we've been on a, a, a capital raise over the, the last while as Lango and, you know, we, we're very fortunate to, to be in a position now where we're, we're about to make an announcement in that regard. So that's going to be a significant step for us and, and hopefully that's going to lead to others, you know. But, mm. um, so I think we, we're starting to see very strong momentum um, behind it, but it's still quite, it's, it's still quite niche and still quite pocketed mm. with very specific investors. But that grouping of um, of investors that, that are showing interest is growing. You know, there's no doubt mm. about that. So, you know, we had a, as an example, um, you know, we've obviously raised a lot of capital out of, you know, North America, Middle East, um, South Africa, and, and there's more of that coming now again. But we've had discussions over the last couple of weeks now with a, a big impact fund, as an example, out of Asia. And, um, you know, but it, it's still, and, and, and it looks pos positive, but, you know, there's these sort of impact funds as well and I think that's going to be a large source of, of income for, or equity for us um, over mm. the next coming years. I think, you know, we are obviously targeting an IPO in the next two and a half years uh, in, in London. And, you know, we, we see the whole impact story as really being an underpin mm. to, to attracting capital. Similarly, mm. green bonds, as Jake mentioned, that's yep. also something we're looking at. But the reality is that a lot of these players, and, you know, if I use this, this Asian investor that, that we're, we're talking to as a proxy for that, you know, they, they want to see investments into platforms where green is ticked everywhere. You know, yep. all your assets are edge certified. Um, you know, you've got, you've got energy saving initiatives, mm. solar, et cetera, on, mm. on all your assets. And, you know, there, there are no portfolios in Africa that can tick the box on all of that, yep. you know, at the stage. So, yes, we've made a lot of progress in that regard, but they're mm. wanting to see that already. So it's a case of, well, we can't do that until we actually have the money Mm. They don't want to give the money until it's done. So, mm. so there's a compromise that needs to be met here, and I think yep. it's a case of education and, and evolution. But there's mm. no doubt that the market is, is growing in that sense. Um, and, you know, I think that's going to be a major source of capital. But the reality yep. is we need more platforms like ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, where, mm -hmm. where there's sufficient scale. You, your, your point about people not getting out of bed for less than $100 million or so, you know, we, we, we need to have that amount of scale to attract capital, which can then facilitate the exit for some of the, the, the development initiatives that are taking place, you know, people in, in this mm. room. So um, I think things are looking up uh, in short, um, but it's, it's still not an easy and it's quite a nuanced mm. niche market internationally. Yeah. I think what you touch on around the impact side, I think is, is, is a really interesting, you know, pillar to, I guess, liquidity in, in Africa. And, you touch on sort of, yes, the, the chicken and egg around portfolios not, you know, meeting some objectives. But I guess the question, and, and to you, Shavira, um, you know, one would look at it from the outside and think ESG and think of the social impact, uh, you know, certainly also the environmental side. Uh, we should be able to offer quite a compelling sort of story to inter uh, international investors, right? I guess the question is, you know, well, one, are we? I mean, I think the, the answer to that is probably not, not quite yet to the full potential. But what, I guess the question is, what do we need to do? I mean, how do we need to sort of uh, collectively, you know, champion Africa as the home of ESG capital? I mean, I think we've now surpassed $3 trillion of, of ESG funds globally, so it's, it's a significant weight of capital. You just need a few drops of that, and uh, you know, it's, it's a very different game changer. So, Sophia, what, what do you think we sort of need to do to kind of get us uh, a seat at that, that table? I think, you know, I'd like to add about, it's big buildings, and for us at Grit and Gria, what we do quite well is think of investment or new development. We bring in the people aspect into it we think about how we're going to impact, number one, the environment, number two, the people in which our buildings uh, basically shape the communities in which it resides. 
And I think if we start shaping our mentality around ESG, the environment, the people, I think we're going into the right direction. As Tom mentioned just now, I think it's, it's not so easy because it is somewhat a chicken and egg situation. Us as developers making that choice, we don't need to put green initiatives into our building, but we do because we know the longer term impact and the longer term investment profile that is out there to be able to seek to make bigger profits later on. So I think our investors, property developers, property owners need to understand the longer term growth and longer term initiative here. So I think ESG is, needs to be in everyone's number one top mm. priority on the agenda next to return on investment. And, and that's where I think it goes beyond buildings, creating that impact for the environment, environment and society as a whole. Mm. And as I said before, um, you know, buildings shape the communities in which they, they reside. And, and, that, and once we start bringing that into our, our feasibility studies, into the decisions we need to make in order uh, for whether we basically go for a project or not, is going to be a key to that solution. Yeah. Mm. Funke, I want to sort of ask you a very sort of similar follow-up question to that around the impact side. I mean, it's obviously critical for you um, globally and, and in the region. Um, I mean, how, how do you see us kind of elevating our value proposition as Africa into that, that global sustainable funding uh, world? I mean, absolutely. I, I think at Actis, we pride ourselves how having been ahead of the curve. And we're very pleased to now see that, you know, um, the discussion globally is now coming up in terms of uh, focus on energy transition, impacting in terms of, you know, how you can even access finance at a debt level and also at the equity level. And I think also, we've also seen firsthand in terms of the benefits of this. So we have pioneered green uh, buildings in a lot of our markets. Uh, I think we have sitting maybe the seventh uh, first uh, green building in, in the key cities where we've operated. Um, I think, you know, it's good to now see that it's not only affecting um, the finance, it's also in terms of tenant choices. I think previously some tenants would claim they could stay in any building, uh, but now with green buildings and the, and the discourse, uh, it's actually becoming a competitive advantage. So when we made those investments, uh, that wasn't clear, but we did predict that at some point in time, the market will come to, to, to that. Um, you know, sitting now with the energy cost spike, you're basically beginning to see the, the, the effect and the benefit in terms of you know, the operational costs, in terms of the green buildings being more significant. I think pre this energy spike, we're sitting between 25 to 30% more cost-effective than comparable buildings. I think that benefit is mm. there. Um, I think it's great to also be able to take this uh, and actually place this in terms of what we're doing, which is trying to now look at that sustainable uh, income fund product uh, for us, uh, which also is a reflection of the development uh, of the overall market itself. Um, important to also note that you know, we able to raise the first um, green financing, uh, which is what our bankers, uh, Standard Bank, tell us we are the first uh, in, uh, that was closed a year, uh, about a year and a half ago. So, mm. and obviously with some savings in terms of margins, uh, not as much as we would have hoped, mm -hmm. but a savings nonetheless. Fantastic. Sheikh, you, you know a thing or two about the topic. Um, for the audience, HC Capital uh, was uh, the first West Africa, was, you know, behind the first uh, West African green bond uh, for the refinance of Cosmos Yupungon. Uh, for, if you, you don't know, Yupungon is quite a, uh, I guess, a, an area of uh, Abidjan that is, you know, quite uh, dominated by a lot of informal traders. Uh, so this, there's two things that sort of stand out for me is one, the ability to sort of take a more formal product into quite an informal market, which, you know, in terms of the bottom of the pyramid principles, uh, is quite an attractive op proposition for Africa um, to, to, to unlock a sort of institutional, or well, the scale that we need, right? But obviously, this, the second bit, and you alluded to it in your introduction around 
creativity and, and flexibility. But so obviously the, the green aspect aside, I mean, talk us through the, that process, what you did, what was it, and, and I think as an instrument, um, you know, that's, I think that's a, that's a really good case study and model for, for the region. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have to admit it was, uh, it was a very difficult uh, process to go through because, you know, it was the, the first, so there's sometimes first mover's advantage and the first mover disadvantage, but it was, you know, in incredibly rewarding to be able to, to go through the, the whole process. And, and what we've seen, so at, at first, you know, we thought that it would be an opportunity to truly diversify the investor base. And we're hoping that we're going to have a mix of local investor and international investors because there's a high yeah. demand yeah. for um, international investors for, for green bonds and green papers because through the process, you basically have to um, do everything you have to do as if you're doing a normal yeah. bond issuance. So yeah. you have to go to the capital markets authority, you have to get a visa, et cetera, et cetera. But you also have to get your paper certified green, which meant that you know we needed to get a third party opinion of a company from Norway. We needed to get the climate bond initiatives um, to also certify the, the paper. Mm -hmm. um, and you know you, you need to put in place the right framework for to reporting, et cetera. And basically, you know, there was pre, before we opened it, we had some um, interest from a couple of Nordic investors as well. But what happened is once we actually opened it to the local market, uh, in a couple of days, we were 30% oversubscribed, uh, yeah. which was shocking um, to us because, you know, we weren't sure how the market um, would, 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 would welcome this. But... What we're seeing is, is that actually, you know, the, 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 the local players are actually, you know, we need to give them a lot more mm. credit um, that we typically do. Um, they're a lot more sophisticated than, than people think. Um, but what they do need is, is, is the product to be structured and presented to them. Yeah. Um, and that's a lot of the feedback uh, that we get. And that's very encouraging for us going forward. Um, and I think, you know, we, we took inspiration when we did this from, from Acorn that you know, mm -hmm. did something similar um, in Kenya before and they actually helped us in the, in the process, giving Fantastic. us advice and you know, they did the same in, in, in East Africa. And so I, I think you know, mm. up to now, um, being certified green using Edge or LEED or any of the other of these tools mm. was seen as maybe a little bit of a, of a nice to have, but you know, as you're saying now, it's becoming part and parcel of, of the story. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if over the next, you know, one, two, three years, it becomes an actual requirement to raise money from certain investors, both mm. internationally and, and, and locally. I think that's a really nice sentiment as well and something also that Thomas touched on in terms of the support from, from Acorn. And I think a lot of institutional capital sort of platforms are sort of seeing the you know the symbiotic relationship that exists between them you know and the that the, they're part of something bigger right so i think there's not almost that much competition Ni, uh, last year standard bank provided lango with a portfolio financing structure worth 300 million dollars it was the largest uh, debt real estate debt transaction on the continent outside of south africa it's a pity you're not here today as it would have been interesting to see who was buying who lunch. Um, <laughs> but, but on a serious note, uh, I mean, you know, that process itself, I guess, uh, provides a lot of learnings for yourselves. Uh, but how, how important do you feel it is from, a, from an investor community f to have local banks that can bring a sophisticated um, you know, suite of, of, of services from a lender perspective. And, and give us some context into that, that deal and, and where you think it's sort of as a springboard to. Thanks. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, I think I still owe Tom lunch. We've had one, but I think there are many more to come. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think for us from a Standard Bank point of view, the development and deepening of um, the debt markets um, 
is quite important. I, I alluded to it earlier where because of the nature of how debt is within the capital stack of real estate finance, it's, it's more or less permanent um, in, that, in that structure. Um, being able to provide um, a, a solution that for a, for a platform that operates in many markets that have many dissimilarities, they're, they're common themes, but a lot of dissimilarities as well, um, allows for, allows the, the 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 sector and the the continent to 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 to, esca to escalate the scale of transactional um, activity that is possible. Um, you 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 mentioned it earlier that a number of the funds uh, or a number of sort of real estate participants part participants uh, capital participants typically um, are looking for larger size transactions. And those are some of the things that, from a market development perspective, we we're trying to um, achieve with, within the context of that um, of these kind of structures to attract more capital, to attract more participants, to um, to to increase the level of collaboration, to finance um, platforms and opportunities in the market. Um, so it was very important for us able to make that structure work, which it was it was the first sort of multi-jurisdictional sort of funding structure put together and to demonstrate that it is achievable um, so that in terms of attracting scale um, capital to the markets, you could do that even if you couldn't do even even if it's a little bit more restrictive on sort of a national sort of or geographic level, you can do that um, on a pan-African level. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we worked with uh, another lender, and obviously with a with a with a client that is forward looking um, in terms of how to um, to manage um, sort of investor sentiments as well as manage their the focus of their operations. So either to what you'd had was just sort of bilateral lens across multiple assets, and that typically creates quite a lot of sort of um, admin intense intensive sort of um, lender relationships. The idea was to simplify that and create, but create also a a model that you can you can scale up for other operators that other other sort of players that want to operate at a at a mm. pan African level. And we're seeing quite a lot more of that um, mm. coming through the, through the market. Mm. So for us, it was it was important. It was innovative, um, and what it also does is also diversifies risks away from from just one one geography to yeah. to multiple yeah. geographies. Uh, those those are themes that continue mm. to, to then sort of en encourage more capital flows into the se into into the sector to support growth and development of the sector. And, and, I think um, yeah, that was critical for us. And I mean, you talk about it from a from an equity and an investor side, but I guess the next layer of that, and maybe that's part of this, is the sort of international debt capital markets and the syndication of this through participants like yourself. I mean, is, are these, uh, you know, is this a sort of platform for that, do you feel? 100%. I mean, we, we, we're involved in other transactions as well now that's um, trying to leverage on, on, <clears throat> on the similar sort of pieces. And with that, you're seeing deeper levels of syndication um, and participation. Um, I, I think the, the objective there you know, um, it's been discussed before that. I mean, obviously, debt is a lot more is a lot is a lot lower on the risk scale than equity. If you encourage sort of the institutional sort of capital sources and um, and uh, international capital sources, international and domestic, actually, in, to to participate at the debt level, it then continues to sort of to deepen. Um, the participation at the equity level. I think that was one of, I mean, um, Sheikh mentioned it, but that was something that is becoming thematic to at least, you know, for lack of a better word, dip your toe in the water and continue to then deepen capital participation, both at a domestic and, 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 um, and international, international, from international perspective as well. Mm -hmm. I think capital is quite because it's because the sector is, um, is 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 heavily dependent on is heavily capital reliant. Yeah, it's important to continue to broaden the base of capital um, that participates mm. to uh, to to grow the market and to take it to actually to the level of of relevance and attraction of capital that it that it it can it can um, it, it should be at. Mm. Uh, Thomas, I guess a follow-up question to you. I mean, obviously, uh, great to see sort of an innovative, um, large, 
quantum of, of debt capital available, but, but more broadly across the continent and not just for yourselves. I mean, um, you know, you know, are we seeing, is it, is it quite a fragmented uh, debt capital markets? Are we seeing sort of the level of sophistication across the board? I know in certain sectors we see a lot more sort of DFI participation. I mean, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, 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 on debt um, across the continent uh, in, in, you know, for, for the sector? I think in, in terms of, I don't know if you can hear me. But okay, so just in, in terms of, um, you know, the local capital markets in the countries that we operate in, mm. they, they're still relatively small, right? So if you look at, uh, when I saw some numbers a couple of years ago in terms of Zambia's total savings industry, it, it, it was less than the debt transaction we did, right? So just to give you a, a feel for that. So, yeah. um, so you know, the reality is for um, the local capital markets in these various countries, they're not developed enough in, in many cases to lend for a long time. They don't have long bond markets, as an mm. example. Um, so it's, it's still dominated to a large extent by some of the key international banks and uh, you know, a lot of the South African banks uh, mm. in, in particular. So um, the, you know, if we look at, at how that's evolving, I, I think there's no doubt that the local banks are starting to play more of a role. They tend to be local currency transactions though, mm. which is, is another, uh, you know, another thing that, that one has to contend with, um, particularly when you're trying to push a hard currency platform essentially to a large extent. That's obviously morphing over time. But, um, but, you know, if we look at, at debt per se, um, you know, I think these type of structures that we, we manage to put in place now is, is really critical from a, a multi-jurisdictional player point of view, which is, you know, many of us on, on this stage. Yeah. Um, it's important to, you know, when you're running assets in, in multi-countries, uh, multi multi-jurisdictional approach to have a simplified structure that allows you to effectively and efficiently manage the business. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what we put in place here was, was essentially, you know, a structure which allowed for commonality of terms uh, across the structure, um, you know, single level of pricing, et cetera, so very easy to manage at the end of the day. Um, but I think going forward in terms of, of debt, you know, I think there's, there's um, you know, the ability to tap or start tapping the local capital markets mm. for the likes of green bonds. I mean, we're yeah. looking at something at the moment. Uh, interestingly, out of Mauritius, you know, there's mm -hmm. a there's a there's a fair amount of, of capital potentially available there. Um, so, you know, there are potentially slightly different sources of, of capital, but I think you know, um, I think the local players, the local capital markets, are growing. I think yeah. they're going to grow with particularly the the smaller end of the transaction size. I think when you get to, you know, deals that we've been closing of 50, 100, or, or, or more million dollars, then that's sometimes a bit too big, you know, and, and particularly in local currency, um, you know, and for long tenor, you know, where we're looking at at least sort of five-year term on debt, mm -hmm. it becomes difficult for them. But, yeah. you know, the reality is our structure we put in place now allows us to, you know, to have a very simple structure, not, not only, you know, in terms of all the, the covenants and so on that I spoke about, but also in terms of adding new players. So, you know, we can, with our, a simple common terms agreement that we put in place, simply plug in an addi additional lender if need be, whether that's one of the big internationals mm. or a local for that matter. Mm. Okay, uh, good. Uh, Funke, you recently marked the close of your fourth real estate fund for Africa since 2004, raising 45 million through Actis West Africa Reef LP. It's now almost a two decade journey. Um, I mean, how is this fund different from some of the others? And, and I guess, more importantly, what are some of the, you know, changes you've seen to the capital markets landscape uh, in Africa over that period? Sure, thanks. Um, I think it's really an exciting point for us, um, raising uh, an income fund, which is, you know, moving down the risk curve hmm. uh, substantially. And I think it's a reflection of the maturity of the market. So. About 15, 16 years ago, um, we were basically focused more on development, greenfield development solely. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, moving on a, a decade and a half, uh, not only ourselves, but uh, a lot of others, uh, and, and in, including those in the room, have developed, um, you know, institutional quality real estate. Uh, what hasn't um, developed as long side with that is the core real estate um, or outside of South Africa. And so that's a, a gap uh, in the market. 
And so there's this opportunity to be able to uh, develop a portfolio of scale assets, um, stabilized assets uh, uh, targeted at core investors in the mm -hmm. world. So if you do look at you know, typical pension funds, they would have anything from five, some go as high as 15% of the allocation to real estate. Mm. Most of that will sit in core real estate. Uh, all the capital we've been able to tap mostly uh, in Africa has been on the opportunistic end. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a challenge for all of us to be able to tap the longer term capital, mm. uh, which hopefully moves into the listed space uh, as Lango uh, has mm. mentioned, they're, they're moving. This is how we're going to develop the capital market. This is how we're going to develop um, the overall market that allows more steady state mm. uh, development to continue to happen. I think the other things that you know, lo looks to the development of the market is that you know, we have more developers who've come into the continent. There's been a de demonstration that value can be created by developing institutional grade real estate on the continent. And you know, if we develop the core holding uh, of this asset, you, you will have a better face in terms of continued developing assets that are needed. Uh, the other thing that's happened in that period is the quality of data that we have, while not optimal and cannot players who, who have contributed to this, the JLL, uh, Brawl, Estate Links, uh, I must not forget, uh, as being part of this. So, you know, definitely a lot, uh, we've moved along in terms mm. of the develop one, development mm. of the market, uh, but the core holding remains very low. Um, in terms of the pension funds, um, Outside of South Africa, the exposure to real estate uh, on the continent remains very low. Uh, most focus on local um, investments in their own core markets uh, in the, within the countries, uh, which doesn't offer diversification. Some of those holdings are actually direct holdings in real estate, which means you know, they're very, very exposed to the volatility that could mm -hmm. occur either in that asset place, either in that location. So I think that for us, we see this as a critical part of the development of the whole value chain uh, of real estate, developing the core. And to be able to have the first close uh, on a sub-car of uh, the overall strategy for this, uh, I think it's a great milestone for us. So what's our proposition? Our proposition is to develop you know, uh, a stabilized portfolio for investors, which is going to look at uh, diversification across geographies. Um, it's also going to have diversification in terms of the different sectors that you have exposure to. So in addition to traditional focus on um, commercial, uh, office and retail, um, there's also going to continue to move into the industrial space, for instance. We also kind of look at it in terms of you know, infrastructure, because the focus for Africa really is how are we going to provide infrastructure? Mm. Uh, and I think real estate is a critical part of the infrastructure. Mm. And we look at real estate in terms of, you know, what's the infrastructure that we need to support the businesses? What is the infrastructure that we need to support social um, services? So, you know, education is a, a space where we're looking at saying we could support uh, either through student housing or, co or, or real um, core real estate for education services in the tertiary sector, for instance. Um, and you know, the other great thing that's happening is that there's much more focus in terms of looking at the different activities that continues to be more sustainable um, into, and less cyclical. So providing in terms of, and we've seen how industrial sector has been very stable all through COVID. I think in terms of the presentation that was given by Golam, I think that really fits into how we see the long-term opportunities for the sector. And I think one thing that does excite us, um, I think is what um, called the third um, driver, which is innovation. 
and uh, we call the digital disruption that is going on. I think that this is providing a way where in the informal sector, the black economy mm. as it's called uh, in Africa, is being organized not within corporates, mm -hmm. but through the use of technology that uh, provides the ability for skill. So you're having uh, intermediaries providing logistics services on scale to thousands and hundreds of thousands of small scale businesses and now can require um, warehousing and logistics space, which generally would not have been available. So there's a lot of innovation that's happening that we do think that uh, continue to support the long-term growth. And I think that being able to offer a product that provides you know, not just the demographic um, dividend or the potential for um, investors is, um, is quite uh, interesting and we're, we're happy to, or we're very pleased that we, we, we mm. started out on this journey. Great, my last question, Shavira, a quick one for you. I mean, we've heard a lot about investments and the, the shifting past development. Development's a huge part of the story, right? And I think for you, quite an interesting model. Um, the turnkey approach, very dollarized sort of pro, I mean, you're still tapping into the same capital markets. I mean, why is this the thesis for yourselves very quickly? I think for us, uh, it's very much sectoralized. We, we basically identified sectors that we want to invest in. Uh, a few of them to mention is uh, healthcare, hospitality, uh, data centers, light industrial, and uh, diplomatic housing. I think uh, data centers, for one, is quite an exciting one. For us, being in the fourth industrial revolution, there's quite a demand in terms of data centers in Africa. Africa is lagging behind when it comes to that space. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in growing that sector. And uh, we're quite proud to say that we've just completed our first asset last year in Nigeria, Lagos. Having said that, diplomatic housing as well is a niche sector. A lot of people might think, why not include that as the residential sector, but diplomatic housing has become a new sector for us. It is so specific, it's very different to your normal residential. It has a lot more security infrastructure requirements. It's, it's a different concept from a build, live, play type of environment. And that's quite a new sector that we're concentrating on. Uh, with regard to data centers, uh, there's quite a large impact on light industrial. A lot of online shopping is happening, which means we need more space to, to store goods that need to be delivered to homes and offices. So we're seeing there's a lot of collaboration between these new sectors, and it's quite an exciting time. Mm. Fantastic. Well, I think we, we, we're out of time, and I think uh, thank you very much to my panelists. I think just to sort of, I guess, my, my key takeouts, you know, I think it's... Um, We've seen a lot of progress, at times slow. I think obviously we are gonna see some headwinds, but I think we're, we're pretty battle-hardened uh, as a region for, for dealing with those. Um, I think yeah, we, we are gonna sort of see a lot more sort of participation from local institutional capital as well. It's not only about the international capital. Um, and I think as that, this evolves, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting story. I think an absolutely critical pillar is that ESG um, impact or sustainability uh, pillar, doesn't matter what you want to call it, with, and with 40% of carbon emissions coming from the built environment, you know, we, we absolutely have to address and own this uh, as an investor community. And I think Africa has a really compelling story to offer global capital in this regard. So it's an exciting space and fantastic that we've got a platform here from API to, to, to make the case for, um, for Africa. So yeah, everyone enjoy the conference. Thank you.